my screen visible? Yes, it is visible. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, ma'am, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saptarishi, sir, for uh, this opportunity. And also thank you to ESI, uh, especially Dr. Ganpati, sir, Dr. Kalra, sir, and Dr. Rakesh Sai, sir, who have envisioned this series of talks on diagnostic endocrinology, which is a very interesting uh, subject. And it's an area where you know, a lot of people uh, find you know, uh, various nuances and various uh, you know, challenges. So uh, this is a great topic to discuss. So what we're going to discuss is assessment of insulin secretion and insulin sensitivity. But before I begin, uh, you know, just like you have unifying theory in uh, physics, you know, the grand unification theory, uh, you know, uh, scientists for years together have worked on, uh, you know, trying to unify the various uh, forces. Uh, in the same way, uh, you know, there is a unifying theory for diabetes. You know, we all talk about type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, uh, Modi, you know, other forms of diabetes. But, you know, at end of the day, uh, diabetes is basically hyperglycemia. And it's for all practical purposes, an imbalance between insulin secretion and insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance. So, you know, for a patient with type 2 diabetes, what you're really looking at is that the patient is having higher amount of insulin resistance compared to the amount of insulin sensitivity which the patient has. And when you're talking about type 1 diabetes, at the end of the day, the patient has absolutely very low insulin secretion, but the insulin sensitivity may be still preserved, or in some cases, there could be mild insulin resistance. Now, at any point of time, even if you take a patient with type 1 diabetes, there is always a component of insulin resistance, which is which kind of triggers the entire event. For example, you know, if you see a young child with type 1 diabetes, often the first presentation is with a diabetic ketoacidosis, which often uh, you know, uh, comes in the light of a, uh, you know, a infection, possibly a UTI, a respiratory infection in current state, COVID-19 infection. So at all points of time, there is an insulin resistance, which triggers an insulin uh, uh, deficiency, which makes it worse. And ultimately the patient lines up with diabetic ketoacidosis. So at end of the day, no matter what form of diabetes you're talking about, you are seeing what you're basically seeing is an imbalance between insulin secretion and insulin resistance. So this is the grand unification theory for diabetes. And in this context, uh, we are going to discuss the two very important elements of diabetes that is insulin secretion and insulin resistance. Now, first let's talk, talk about insulin resistance. So how do you assess insulin resistance? Now, a lot of these things which you're going to discuss, they are very important from a research perspective. They're very important for endocrinologists to really you know, study uh, their patients in more detail, uh, for, for pharmacologists to develop new uh, drugs, for, you know, uh, for researchers to look at uh, you know, epidemiological aspects of diabetes. However, a lot of these are not very important in clinical practice. Now, some aspects of this are very important in clinical practice, whereas most of these are more important from a research perspective. So what we're going to do is we're going to discuss both what is important for clinical practice as well as what is important for research. And it's going to be uh, intertwined amongst each other, but I'll point out where what is important and where we should give more focus to what. So to give you a one slide summary about insulin resistance, uh, the various uh, you know, tests that we do for insulin resistance have very limited use in clinical practice. So at the end of the day, you know, uh, what is really, what are you really, really going to gain uh, at an individual patient level by assessing their insulin resistance? Not much, right? The only, you know, the advice what you're going to give to your patient is to, you know, uh, a pre-diabetic individual with obesity, what you're going to ask for is basically exercise, diet, perhaps metformin, right? But, you know, whether you do it with expensive uh, investigations or whether you do it by clinical judgment, it really does not matter. Uh, you know, so for an individual perspective, it has very limited use. But from a research perspective, it is very, very useful. So for all practical purposes, clinical examination and surrogate markers are very useful. So this is what should be focused on. And we are in, in the next few slides also going to discuss the clinical uh, aspects uh, of insulin resistance. Uh, but the gold standard, which is mainly uh, used in uh, research, is the hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp. So the clamp studies are the one which are uh, you know, used mainly for research purposes. And these are considered to be gold standard or assessment of insulin resistance. So, you know, overall, if you talk about assessment for insulin resistance, it can be done in two major ways. One is the direct methods and the indirect methods. The direct methods include what we talked about, hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp. You can use an insulin suppression test and insulin tolerance test. 
On the other hand, you have indirect methods like clinical markers, which you're going to discuss, insulin indices, which form a major chunk of today's lecture, and certain surrogate clinical and biochemical markers of insulin resistance. So let's first talk about the direct methods for assessment. Now, the most uh, you know, frequently used method uh, in mainly in research labs is what is known as hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp. Now, this is considered to be the gold standard for assessment of insulin resistance. Again, I reiterate that at individual patient level, this is not generally very useful, but very useful for research. Now, uh, Dr. Ralph DiFranzo, uh, you know, who is who is one of the pioneers in uh, uh, you know uh, diabetes therapeutics, uh, is one of the people who actually proposed this uh, CLAMP studies long time back. So, you know, these CLAMP studies have a lot of importance, but mainly more of historical importance and research importance rather than clinical practice importance. So what you do in a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic CLAMP, as the term suggests, it is euglycemia. So you're trying to maintain a steady level of glucose. So you give a first, first you give an insulin infusion. So instead of giving glucose first, you give an insulin infusion first. And this is done to block the hepatic gluconeogenesis, right? So you block the hepatic glucose production then the glucose infusion is given and it is adjusted to maintain a steady state of plasma glucose. Now, when the hepatic glucose is suppressed, the amount of glucose given from outside, what you are you know, given, ex giving exogenously to maintain euglycemia is the amount of glucose that goes into the muscle. Now, if you require more glucose to maintain euglycemia, that means that more glucose is going to the muscle, which means that patient has higher insulin sensitivity and lower insulin resistance. However, if you need less glucose, it means that less glucose is going to the muscle, which means you have more insulin resistance. So it is exactly the opposite. So basically uh, what you're doing is you're suppressing, you're clamping the hepatic glucose output, and then you are maintaining a steady state of glucose level. So to interpret the results, typically, uh, remember the higher the uh, glucose infusion rate means that you have higher sensitivity and less resistance and vice versa. So if you have uh, you know glucose infusion rates of more than 7.5, it is considered to be normal. 4.5 to 7 is variable and less than 4 would be considered to be insulin resistance. Now, the next is insulin suppression test. Now, insulin suppression test, remember the old dictum in endocrinology. Whenever, is, whenever a hormone is found to be thought to be in uh, excess or thought to be high, we try to suppress it. If a hormone is found to be low, we try to stimulate it, right? So that's the typical dictum we use. For example, let's say in Cushing syndrome, we are suspecting the cortisol to be high we try to suppress the cortisol in additions or, or adrenaline insufficiency. We are thinking that the cortisol is low. We are trying to stimulate the cortisol level. So in the same way, when you're thinking about insulin resistance, you mean you, you think you're thinking that the insulin levels are high, you're, you will try to suppress the insulin level. So that's what is, what is basically done in an insulin suppression test. You can use different agents for suppression of insulin. Typically, currently, uh, what is used frequently is octrotype. So you can use octrotype to suppress the endogenous insulin production. And now the insulin infusion and glucose infusions are given and the dose is adjusted to achieve again a steady state of plasma glucose concentration. So one, the steady state is achieved, the higher the uh, steady, higher the glucose required to achieve the steady state, higher the insulin resistance. So this is the uh, insulin suppression test. Then you have, of course, insulin tolerance test. Now, insulin tolerance test is completely outdated, right? Uh, I'll not discuss this in too much detail, but you know, uh, I don't think this is going to be very useful in clinical practice at all. Uh, the only question you have to ask is, would you like to produce hypoglycemia in your subject to assess for insulin resistance? That's all. That's the only question you need to ask yourself. And if your answer to this is no, then don't do this test, right? This test is not recommended in, uh, in current era. It is a slight, you know, more or less outdated test. So basically what you do is after an overnight fast, uh, you give a bolus of insulin to the patient and this will reduce the glucose level to about 50%. Uh, and sometimes we even provoke a uh, frank hypoglycemia. And if the patient has a peripheral insulin resistance, you know, you will require, uh, you know, higher insulin resistance means you'll require more insulin to produce uh, hypoglycemia. Lower insulin resistance means less insulin is required. It's a very simple concept to understand, but it is, it is extremely dangerous to perform. So hence, perhaps, you know, this is not a test which you should perform in day-to-day -day practice. Then let's talk about the indirect methods for assessment of insulin resistance. Now here, the frequently used and perhaps I would say frequently abused are the insulin indices, right? Now, these are very simple to calculate, simple tests to perform, a uh, little bit expensive uh, and in individual cases, not very useful, right? So this is something, you know, a very controversial 
uh, area. So again, a very frequently used test is what is known as a HOMA IR. HOMA IR can be simply uh, tested by checking the fasting insulin level uh, multiplied by the glucose level divided by 22.5 if you're using it in millimoles. And if you're you know, using milligram per deciliter, like all of us do, then you will uh, uh, divide by 405. So basically, the physiological basis of HOMA is that the relationship between glucose and insulin in the basal state reflects the balance between hepatic glucose output and insulin secretion, which is maintained by a feedback loop between the liver and the beta cell, right? So in a steady, so in a fasting state, uh, the glucose is mainly produced by the liver. So that is a hepatic glucose output. And the, in, the beta cell produce the insulin to counteract this uh, glucose, uh, which is produced, and hence you have maintain a steady state. And there's a constant feedback between the two. Right. So between the liver and the beta cell, there is a feedback loop, which is there. So if the glucose level increases from the liver, you have more insulin production and you have less uh, amount of glucose, then you have less insulin production. So there's a constant feedback which is being generated. So uh, this is the uh, basic, uh, you know, premises of the HOMA IR test. Right. Typically, uh, looking at the test, you know, uh, uh, it, and if you are performing this, uh, in prepubertal children, if the value is more than 2.5, it is considered to be insulin resistant. And in pubertal children or adults uh, with SMR more than or sexual maturity rating more than 2 or higher, if it's more than 4, it is considered to be insulin resistant. Now, I why we have put this slide actually to tell you that, uh, you know, a lot of the times this test is extremely abused uh, in pediatric practice. I've seen, you know, a lot of, in, uh, you know, pediatric children obese pediatric children, you know, ask for HOMA IR. In PCOS adolescents, we ask for HOMA IR. Now, practically speaking, yes, it is useful to quantitate insulin resistance. But if you find an acanthosis nigricans in your child, that's the best God-given marker for insulin resistance. You don't need a test to prove it, right? So you don't need to perform this expensive test. And the patients, uh, you know, the parents of the patient constantly fret over this. They constantly, you know, lose the sleep over this. That's not important. What the child rather, you know, you'd rather spend the time and money on better counseling for uh, lifestyle measures uh, rather than, you know, spend the money on doing this test. Uh, the current guidelines also on pediatric obesity do not recommend the use of, uh, uh, you know, these markers for assessment of insulin resistance, unless, of course, you're doing it uh, in context of a research study. Then you have HOMA 2. So the issue with HOMA was that, you know, uh, the HOMA originally was developed for uh, insulin assays based on RIA, but now you have better assays, you have different assays, you know, you have uh, uh, immunological assays for uh, insulin and other assays which have been developed. So hence the HOMA model had to be uh, revamped. So this is a new model, which is a, uh, you know, a computer generated model. So this version actually incorporates the estimation of pro-insulin also into the model because, uh, you know, uh, now we realize that there's a lot of uh, the insulin which is detected is actually pro-insulin. So it also counters this into account. It also takes renal glucose losses uh, also into account. So it's an updated model. And now you have also C-peptide uh, can be used in place of insulin uh, as a marker. So, you know, you have this HOMA2, which is available. Uh, this is available from the Oxford's website. You know, I've given a screenshot of the website. You can download it. It is available as a standalone app. So you can download this app. I'll show you the app. This is, this is an app for Mac. So this is a HOMA2 calculator. Uh, you enter the plasma glucose value, you can, you know, use different units and you enter the fasting insulin levels. Uh, you can again see the different units here. So it gives you the percentage, uh, you know, HOMA beta, the percentage HOMA S, that is HOMA sensitivity, percentage sensitivity. These are very simple to understand. And then of course, insulin resistance or IR. For example, I'll give an example of a, a patient, uh, you know, let's say the fasting glucose was 90 milligram per deciliter. The fasting insulin level was eight. Uh, and, you know, in terms of micro units per ml, uh, so the HOMA beta percentage is a normal patient, non-diabetic, non-insulin resistant patient. So you can see the HOMA beta percentage was 97%. The sensitivity was 96%, which is pretty good. So this patient basically is, is doing well, right? And the insulin resistance is 1.04, which we saw that in adults, less than four is considered to be normal. So this is a typical example of a HOMA 2 calculator. Now, HOMA beta is a assessment for insulin sensitivity. Of course, we are going to discuss in more detail about insulin sensitivity. But I thought, you know, it would be a good point to really uh, take this point here when we're discussing HOMA anyways. So HOMA beta is calculated by 20 into fasting plasma insulin divided by fasting plasma glucose minus 3.5. Here, of course, you know, you use fasting FPI in, uh, uh, you know, micro units per uh, liter and fasting plasma glucose in millimoles per liter or micro units per ml, right? So this is the similar. So, uh, you know, uh, 
this is how you calculate the HOMA beta. Now, the problem is that, of course, these tests are all available, but like I said, they're very useful in mainly for research purposes, for epidemiological purposes, for uh, you know physiological studies, but they're not very useful for individual patient level. So where do you use HOMA? You basically use it for, you can use it in individual patient for longitudinal follow-up of the same patient. So if you do see the progressive decline uh, of your patient, uh, a patient's beta cell, you can use this. You can very well use this in epidemiological and cross-sectional studies. And of course, you can use it in certain physiological situations. Like, for example, if I want to see what is the insulin resistance in a pubertal uh, children versus a prepubertal child, something like that, you know, you can use it in physiological situations. Uh, of course, there are important caveats for use of HOMA. So we remember, we do not have population and ethnic specific data. Most of this was developed from the United Kingdom. So you don't have specific data for Indian patients or South Asians. Uh, you cannot use it when the glucose and uh, glucose and insulin levels are fluctuating. For example, if the patient has acute hyperglycemia or diabetic ketoacidosis or COVID-induced hyperglycemia, you, know, you cannot use these tests. You cannot use it for a patient who is on exogenous insulin uh, because mainly you're using insulin levels. And of course, you know, that will be detected. The exogenous insulin will be detected. So you cannot use it. And per se, it would be not, it would not be a good idea for using it on patients on insulin secretagogues like sulfonuria, but in selected cases, you know, you can use it. However, you should know how to interpret those results. One very important caveat is that, remember, HOMA beta cannot be reported in isolation. This is something which a uh, lot of, uh, you know, uh, endocrinologists also need to understand. Uh, HOMA beta has, all, all, it always has to be reported with a HOMA IR or HOMA sensitivity. Uh, the reason is that, let's say a patient is very young and fit, right, and has very low insulin, a very high insulin sensitivity, very low insulin resistance. In that case, when you put the values in the calculator, you'll find the HOMA beta to be lower uh, and the insulin sensitivity to be very high. So in such a scenario, you will falsely interpret this as low, low HOMA beta values. This is one of the challenges, right? So whenever you, uh, uh, you know, give a report of HOMA beta, it has always to be given with HOMA IR. HOMA beta cannot be interpreted in isolation. This is something which uh, labs and both the doctors also need to really understand. Then, of course, you have variations of HOMA. So HOMA was the original index. Then people thought, you know, why not make it better? So then you had other variations, you know, so you have something known as quickie. Uh, you know, you can see the formula. I just quickly breeze through this. Uh, you have Macaulay index. In fact, Macaulay index includes triglyceride, which makes it a very sensible index. Uh, and I think, you know, if you want to use anyone, of course, the formula is very complicated. You have online calculators to use it. But uh, Macaulay index is a very sensible index because it uses uh, other surrogate markers like triglyceride, which is a very important marker of insulin resistance. So uh, this is the one. And in fact, in clinical studies also, Macaulay index has been found to be most, uh, you know, uh, has the best correlation with the clinical parameters of insulin resistance. Uh, as you can see from this study uh, from Korea, the Macaulay index compared to other indices showed the highest accuracy in detection of metabolic syndrome as a surrogate marker of insulin resistance. So just to summarize, these are the various values uh, which you can use uh, for insulin indices. You can take a screenshot of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and save it for use. But like I said, we don't use this very commonly in clinical practice. Now let's come to the clinical markers of insulin resistance. So you have, you know, uh, uh, what does a patient with insulin resistance look like, right? So if you see from, uh, you know, head to toe, uh, you know, the patient could have features of pseudo acrochemically. Remember, higher insulin levels uh, will have, you know, specificity, specificity spillover uh, on the IGF-1 uh, receptor. Remember, the, the uh, insulin like growth factor and insulin have very similar uh, molecular structures. So, you know, a uh, patient could look acromegaloid, you know, you could, you could find, uh, you know, sometimes a newly diagnosed insulin resistant uh, type 2 diabetes patient looks like acromegaloid. Right? So this is something you should keep in mind. Patients can have muscle hypertrophy. Echinthosis nigricans is the most common clinical presentation of insulin resistance. Patient can have skin tags, uh, hirsutism, alopecia, uh, oligoamenorrhea, infertility, anovulation, central adiposity, which is a very important marker. Uh, certain patients can have lipodystrophic syndromes like lipoatrophy or hypertrophy, which are, you know, though rare, uh, must not be missed out. And children, of course, can have normal impaired or sometimes even accelerated growth. So sometimes insulin resistant children, you will find that they are taller than their counterparts uh, because again, because of specificity spillover and higher, uh, you know, insulin acting on the IGF-1 receptor. Then you have surrogate biochemical markers uh, of insulin resistance. Of course, the most important is uh, metabolic syndrome as such. You know, the, one of the reasons why we don't use insulin resistant tests is because you have the clinical uh, syndrome 
which is metabolic syndrome. We all know the definition of metabolic syndrome, so I'm not going to detail, but this is the definition. Again, you know, those who are new to this can take a screenshot and save this for future use. There's another very useful index, which is known as a triglyceride glucose index. Now, you know, uh, all of these theories, you know, like I said, I have this, you know, one more theory, which I would like to really propose. I very strongly believe that both a fasting as well as a post meal triglyceride is a very, very strong marker of insulin resistance and also a very strong marker of future risk of developing diabetes mellitus as well as future risk of developing coronary artery disease. So, you know, some of these young patients who come to me uh, who are who have come for, you know, their, their routine checkups and they have very high tri triglyceride levels, uh, typically, you know, more than 150. Uh, that is the time I start counseling them for weight loss, lifestyle measures and so on and so forth because these group of patients have very high risk of developing uh, diabetes mellitus and coronary artery disease in future. So triglyceride glucose index, can it's very simple to calculate. You use, use a log of fasting triglyceride into plasma glucose divided by two. Uh, and those with higher levels of, uh, you know, this index have 1.16 times higher risk of developing uh, coronary artery disease and, uh, you know, higher risk of developing diabetes. Uh, so clinical applications, where do you consider using these markers of insulin resistance? Uh, at individual levels, you can use it for assessment of risk of developing type 2 diabetes, assessment of future risk of cardiovascular disease. And of course, it becomes a very important point to initiate discussion on lifestyle measures for your patient. Uh, one more very important thing I'd like to tell you. Again, you know, going back to the uh, triglyceride index, I very strongly believe that the features of metabolic syndrome, NASH or NFLD, that is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So those patients having higher SGPT, uh, you know, uh, have, or having on ultrasound, uh, you know, fatty liver and high triglyceride, all these three are often, they exist in the same patient, right? And this is the patient who has very high risk of developing diabetes. In fact, we have seen a lot of uh, patients, uh, you know, we look at the past records and young uh, patients who come with type 2 diabetes, if you see their, you know, uh, one year or two year report uh, reports back, you know, they'll have this thing very common. They'll have high triglyceride levels and they'll have an ultrasound report showing a grade one fatty liver. And nobody took notice of this. And the patient went on to develop diabetes, you know. So I think a good point, a very important point here is to start a discussion on lifestyle measures when you see these patients at this point of time, rather than wait for the patient to develop diabetes. And in today's COVID era, it's especially important because the same group of patients, they will often have a baseline HP1C of six. We had a great talk by Dr. Balram Sharma about HP1C. You know, the baseline HP1Cs will be six, but if they develop COVID and if they're giving steroids, their sugars go as high as 300. So this, this is something, and you know, we know that this higher glyce, hyperglycemia is a marker for uh, higher mortality. So this is something you should all keep in mind when dealing with these patients. Uh, how do you assess insulin secretion? So we looked at insulin resistance. Now let's look at the other end of the spectrum that is insulin secretion. So there are, you know, insulin is secreted in two ways. When you have the basal insulin secretion, and then you have a stimulated secretion. Now stimulation of insulin occurs after nutrient, right? For example, you know, glucose or carbohydrates and so on. Uh, uh, it could be mediated by other hormones. It could be mediated, for example, glucagon stimulates insulin release, and it could be mediated by pharmacological agents, for example, you know, sulfonylureas, right? So this is how insulin is released. Now insulin is released post meal in two phases. One is the first phase insulin secretion, and then you have the second phase insulin secretion. Now what happens is that there are ready-made, uh, you know, uh, insulin granules in the beta cells. These are ready to be released, right? So these are so as soon as the, uh, you know, the signal comes for, uh, you know. Uh, a post meal or glucose surge, uh, these preformed, uh, you know, glucose uh, preformed insulin granules they immediately release the insulin. So this is the first phase insulin secretion, and then you have, you know, a recruitment of new uh, insulin granules, and this this go on to, uh, you know, produce the second phase of insulin release. Now, why this is important? Because loss. I'm repeating this again, giving focus to this loss of first phase of insulin secretion is one of the earliest markers of diabetes mellitus, type 2 diabetes mellitus, uh, to, for that matter, even type 1. So the loss of first phase insulin secretion is one of the very important markers of the future risk of patient developing diabetes mellitus. And hence, it is very, very important to recognize this initial uh, loss. So why do we, why, you know, some patient, you know, when you're talking about insulin secretion, one patient just asked me, sir, why don't we just measure the insulin levels? You have this test, insulin test, why don't we measure it? The reason is very simple. Remember, the majority of endogenous insulin, which is secreted, goes into the portal circulation. The insulin resistance basically impacts the levels of insulin apart from 
uh, you know, uh, just your insulin secretion. So this also has to be kept in mind. If the patient is on exogenous insulin administration, again, that will be detected. And remember, secretion is pulsatile in nature. So you will often get, uh, you know, levels at different troughs, troughs and peaks will show different levels. So you can't just directly measure the insulin levels. So you can use a surrogate, which is C-peptide. C-peptide is basically, remember, the uh, pro-insulin is broken down into insulin and C-peptide. So there's an equimolar secretion of uh, C-peptide. So for every, uh, you know, uh, for every amount of insulin that is released, there is an equal amount of C-peptide, which is uh, released. Now, the good thing about C-peptide is, that the amount of C-peptide release is equal to the amount of insulin release, so it's equimolar. The C-peptide is not extracted by the liver, uh, but the endogenous insulin goes to the portal circulation, so majority of it extracted by liver, whereas C-peptide escapes this. The C-peptide clearance occurs mainly by the kidney, so this is constant, and this means at a given point of time, the amount cleared by the kidney is the amount which is being produced. And remember, the exogenous insulin does not have impact on the C-peptide, so this is the reason why C-peptide is a better marker. So how can you assess the phases of insulin secretion or insulin secretion. Remember, all of these, again, have mainly historical importance or mainly importance from a point of view of research rather than point of view of in real life clinical practice. So there are three very commonly, uh, you know, talked about tests, not commonly performed. Uh, it is hyperglycemic clamp. Remember, we talked about earlier, we talked about euglycemic clamp. This is hyperglycemic clamp. We have IV glucose tolerance tests. Uh, we all know about oral glucose tolerance tests. Dr. Balram Sharma talked about this also. Uh, but there is something known as IV glucose tolerance stress, uh, which is, you know, what uh, we'll see in a minute. And then you have something known as sigma. So this is a hyperglycemic clamp, right? So first, like I said, you talked about euglycemic clamp. Now we are talking about hyperglycemic clamp. So this is a study done to assess mainly the first and second phase of insulin response. Here the patient is given an acute burst of glucose, then there is a sharp increase in the glucose. This is the uh, sharp increase in the insulin secretion. This is the first phase insulin secretion. And this, uh, after this, there's a small dip and then there is a second steady state of insulin secretion, which is the second phase of insulin secretion. So basically you give a burst of glucose and then you uh, at regular intervals measure the insulin secretion either by measuring the insulin per se or insulin the, measuring the C-peptide. C-peptide is a better marker per se. Uh, the uh, you know, original classical tests were done using insulin secretion, uh, measurement of insulin. Uh, so this is how you, uh, uh, you know, the hyperglycemic clamp is performed. Uh, and to give you an example, how it looks in a, in a normal person versus a diabetic individual. In a patient with diabetes, there's basically blunting of the first phase of insulin secretion. This I said, like I said, is a marker of uh, early development of di early marker of development of diabetes mellitus. So in a normal individual, you can see a robust first phase and a second phase of insulin secretion. But in a patient with early diabetes, you see the first phase of insulin secretion is lost, but the second phase of insulin secretion is still preserved. And in a late diabetic individual, uh, there's completely flat curve. So there is neither first phase nor there is a good second phase of insulin release. Then of course you have something known as IV glucose tolerance test, uh, IV GTT. Uh, here you give rapid intravenous insulin of glucose which produces a rapid rise in the glucose at a peak at you know and then you measure the peak at about three to five minutes and then it again falls back to normal. Uh, the rate of decrease at between 10 to 30 minutes after the injection can be used to define what is known as uh, disappearance constant which is an index of glucose tolerance. So this is again, like I said, mainly used for research purposes. Uh, there is something known as acute insulin response, which is actually useful in practice. So this is an index derived from intravenous glucose. And here there's a mean increment of insulin secretion over a baseline in the first 10 minutes. So the insulin release in the first 10 minutes is a critical uh, measurement which is taken. This is basically same as first phase insulin secretion. But again, you know, if you see in clinical practice, uh, I'll show you this in a minute. Uh, of course, you have something known as sigma, which is continuous infusion of glucose with model assessment. This is again very similar uh, to this, but here you give a continuous infusion of glucose. So what we are basically seeing is that, you know, uh, in, in patients with uh, diabetes, you have the loss of the first phase of insulin secretion. Now, in some of these patients, you can actually use a non-glucose stimuli. For example, you can use arginine or isoprotenol. And uh, what you see is that in the initial phases, uh, you know, there is loss of response to glucose but the response to a non-glucose stimuli is preserved. So again, you know, in an early type 2 diabetic, you can see uh, there is complete loss of insulin, uh, first phase response to first phase insulin secretion or acute insulin response to glucose, uh, but the response to non-glucose stimuli is preserved. So this patient uh, is early diabetic. So eventually in a patient with, uh, you know, who has complete loss of beta cell function over a period of time, even this response to non-insulin, uh, uh, non-glucose stimuli is also lost over a period of time. This is very fascinating for an endocrinologist 
but I'm sure, you know, in clinical practice, this is very little use uh, in day-to-day -day clinical practice. Now, let's talk about what we use in clinical practice, and that is insulin reserve testing. And this is where the role of C-peptide really comes into picture. So here, what you can do is you can measure C-peptide in the blood uh, directly by either, you know, measuring the fasting C-peptide, you can use a stimulated C-peptide, or you can use a random C-peptide, or you can measure the C-peptide in the urine, which requires a 24-hour urinary collection. Now, of all these, the stimulated C-peptide is the best marker of beta cell reserve. One thing you have to keep in mind, uh, lab-related issue, hemolysis can cause a degradation of C-peptide samples, so you should uh, be very careful by handling these samples. So what are the different ways in which you can stimulate C-peptide? You can use a glucose load, you can use a mixed meal, or you can use glucagon uh, for stimulation. You can use random C-peptide also. In a, so one study had shown that random C-peptide is a very good test better than fasting or stimulated for classification of diabetes. Of course, this is, uh, you know, controversial, but having said that, it's a very good starting point. So, you know, I've seen a lot of doctors ask for fasting C-peptide. Rather, I would say, ask for a non-fasting or a random C-peptide in patients where you want to differentiate between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Uh, how do you interpret a non-fasting C-peptide value? If it's less than, if the C-peptide value is less than 0.6 nanogram per ml, uh, it is strongly suggestive. Remember, see, just see the units, be careful. Your lab may give different units. Uh, so 0.6 nanogram per ml is strongly suggestive of absolute insulin deficiency and strongly suggestive of type 1 diabetes. If it's less than 0.18, it is unlikely, the patient is unlikely to achieve good glycemic control without use of multiple dose of insulin. So all practical purposes, this patient should be given a multi-dose insulin, MDI. But if it's more than 3, it is unlikely to be type 1, more likely to be type 2 or MODI. So this is something which is where, a, you know, a random C-peptide is very useful. Remember another caveat before testing for C-peptide, remember that these, these tests should only be done for once the patient achieves euglycemia. It should not be done in patients who are, uh, you know, having severe hyperglycemia, coming in DK, all these things, you know, once the things are settled down, then you can assess for this. So patients comes in a diabetic ketoacidosis after, you know, you start the patient on insulin infusion. Once the patient settles down after a few weeks, you can perform this test rather than performing it in an acute situation. Uh, glucagon stimulated C-peptide, you... Now you have glucagon easily available. So you can draw a baseline sample after overnight fast, administer one milligram of glucagon IV. And then after that, you, uh, you know, take samples uh, six minutes and 10 minutes after giving glucagon. So you take a C-peptide sample, six minutes and 10 minutes. If you want to take only one sample, you can just take a six minute sample because most of these tests are now designed for, uh, results are designed for six minute sample. Uh, then you have mixed meal stimulation test. This is something we perform in our own uh, laboratory, <coughs> in our own hospital. Uh, uh, you know, it's very easy to do. You measure the fasting, uh, you know, uh, blood glucose with the C-peptide. Then you give a liquid meal, which is either Sustacal or Ensure Plus powder, uh, six scoops in 200 ml of water, and the patient is asked to drink this. And after 90 minutes, you again check the sugar along with the glucose value along with the C-peptide value. Now, uh, you know, for a long time, this test was not performed because, you know, you did not have Sustacal easily available. What is exactly Sustacal? Sustacal is basically a protein powder. It's nothing great. Uh, right, it's it's uh, it's uh, from Nestle. Uh, you have Sustacal Junior available in India, but you don't have the original Sustacal easily available. So you can use a similar composition powder, which is Ensure Plus. Right, I par you know pardon me for using brand names, but you know this is a reality. We have to you know uh, say it because otherwise these tests are not. It's a very easy test to perform. Unfortunately, it's not being done by a lot of people because you know they feel Sustacal is not available. Right, so uh, you can use Ensure Plus, which is similar composition. This is the composition. It's not very easily visible, but you can just, uh, you know, Google this. It's, you know, found everywhere. So basically you need to have a similar composition powder. You can use an Ensure Plus powder, which is very easily available almost everywhere. Now what we have done, uh, you know, something, uh, our own personal uh, uh, data, uh, but we have not published it. So, you know, please consider this as a pre-publication, uh, sort of an expert opinion. We are working on a study for this for a, quite some time. Uh, we are collecting data for that. So what we have done is we have created a scoring system for mixed meal simulation test. Uh, so fasting and post stimulation values. So you can see if the value is less than 0.24 nanogram per ml, again, be careful about the unit. We give a, this is, we call it grade 1F and give a score of 5. Uh, then of course, you know, uh, uh, between 0.24 to 0.26, I think this is jumbled here, 0.6 to 0.1 and more than 0.1. This is the scores that we give. Uh, and post stimulation, you know, again, you can see uh, if the value is between uh, if less than 0.6, the uh, score is five. Uh, again, I you know apologize for this table being incorrectly placed. Uh, 0.6 to 1.5 score of three, 
1.5 to 1.8 score of 2 and 1.5 to 3.3 uh, 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 to give a score of 1. If it's more than 3.3, uh, we it is considered to be normal and we you know do not give any score or score of 0. So uh, in terms of interpretation, you total the value uh, between the fasting and the uh, you know post stimulation value. And if it's more than equal to 5, it is strongly suggestive of type 1 diabetes. If it's between 3 to 5, it is suggestive of type 1 uh, diabetes. Again, you know, uh, most likely to be the same. If it's between 0 to 3, it is unlikely to be type 1, but these patients should be on close follow-up. And both these groups, uh, you know, uh, you should have low threshold for using insulin, especially for this group where you consider using basal bolus insulin. And if the value is 0, it is not type 1. It is more likely to be type 2 or any other form of diabetes. So this is, this is something, like I said, from our own research, uh, but again, you know, be careful before you uh, interpret this because, you know, this is not a published data. We are actually doing a retrospective study on this and uh, we should be publishing this very soon. Uh, so to summarize and to give you some take home messages uh, about insulin resistance, uh, the markers for insulin resistance, the best marker, the best marker for insulin resistance, is actually metabolic syndrome, right? So your central adiposity, if you have acanthosis nigricans, that's all you need. Right? You don't need any complicated and very uh, you know, expensive test. Uh, it is mainly useful for research. For all practical purposes, clinical and surrogate markers are very useful. And amongst the surrogate marker, triglyceride levels along with presence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a very good marker for insulin resistance. And of course, if you talk about gold standard, hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp is the gold standard for insulin resistance. Uh, let's talk about insulin secretion. And insulin reserve testing is something that we do, which find more useful. We talked about C-peptide and stimulated C-peptide. Remember, C-peptide is a surrogate marker of insulin release. So instead of measuring insulin directly, it's better to measure C-peptide. And of course, mixed meal stimulation is very easy to perform. Uh, you, you just read, need Ensure Plus powder, which is simple, easily available. Uh, and this is a good test to, you know, it's a very useful test for patients with ketosis uh, uh, prone diabetes, where you cannot differentiate between type 1 and type 2 and you want to take a call whether to treat this patient for a long time on basal bolus insulin or insulin pump versus treating the patient on uh, basal plus OAD or uh, OADs alone. So this is where uh, these tests could be really useful. So I thank you all for patient listening. And if you want more, you know, all these things on, on a, in a question answer format as a notes thing, you know, we have this website called endocrinology.co.in. It's a kind of a digital garden uh, for endocrinology uh, knowledge. So, you know, something you can find it useful.